Let's open to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. I want to lift a picture that is parallel to what we are going to learn in Hosea. But I want to lift this image out so that we can make a parallel from this because this is something that we're a lot more familiar with. We understand the scenario here and the circumstance and the conditions and sort of the general people that are involved. And I want to sort of insert the spirit of what we get here into our passage. Uh, the Philistines are gathered against Israel. Verse 4, you see that they have brought out a champion named Goliath, who is this enormous man. And he is prepared for battle. Okay? He is ready to tear limb from limb whatever opponent might out of his mind be willing to stand in opposition. And because of his great size, his experience, you see a very common reaction in verse 11. On hearing uh, the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. It is a common reaction. If you look over into verse 25, <clears throat> you see that when the Israelites saw the man in verse 24, they, they flee from him in great fear. And that fear generates some good ideas according to, to man. So you have to bear in mind that this is a 40-day period that we're talking about. Not all these consequences happen just immediate, okay? This is probably a developing moment where the initial thing happens and then these additions begin to take place because the uh, seriousness of the circumstance becomes elevated. So in verse 25, you see that uh, Saul is going to offer anyone who goes out and kills the, the Philistine great wealth. And that is probably, uh, it's probably reading into the text. I, I get it. But it's possible that maybe that little carrot was hung for a week. And then when there was no person from the army who was taking the bite, then they made the bait more attractive and added the wife, uh, uh, who is a daughter of Saul, would also be given to the man who does this and, and, and removes this Philistine. And then perhaps, possibly, there was another week that intervened, or two weeks. And nobody was willing to step up. And so then there's this consultation and, and the king is talking and there's probably some advisors involved. And then he comes back and says, okay, additionally, your, your whole family is going to be... And so there's just sort of this boiling moment. When you are up against an enemy... Uh, it is just instinctive sometimes to be so motivated by your fear that you are sort of losing sight of God. Because the truth is Saul doesn't make it into Hebrews 11 from this chapter. As somebody who is exemplifying the stellar great faith, He's terrified. And as he is, so the people are. 
It's a military moment. And Saul is trying to face his opponent with a thoughtful plan. Here's what I'll do. I'll offer him a bunch of money. I mean, who can refuse a bunch of money? Oh, I'll sweeten the pot. I'll offer my daughter. I'll even, I'll even divvy higher. And, and it's like he's trying to, to bribe out a love for country. And it all seems in the moment to be wise, even uh, to the regulatory disapproval. Look at verse 33. When he is approached by David, he himself is discouraging. You're, you're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He will tear you limb from limb. Okay? Trust us that we know what's really best for you in this situation. Now, what I'm trying to get us to just take with us as we go is a moment of military pressure. And what it looks like here, the picture of Saul is what it looks like to be unfaithful. His wisdom, even his wisdom offered to David, is not later praised or accoladed in any way by God. Saul could have himself had women singing songs about him. Not that you would want to do such for vanity, but he could have if he would have believed like David did in the power of God because Saul was the commander of this army. And this guy, Goliath, sat 40 days despising and defying the army of the living God. Saul could have been. But he wasn't. And that's the only thing that we want to carry with us into our text tonight. So let's go to Hosea with kind of that background. Hosea, uh, if you're looking at the handout, you'll see that there is a brief outline of chapter 9 and chapter 10, which is just basically a repeat, not word for word, but the spirit of it is kind of the same. In chapter 9, there is essentially this idea that uh, the Assyrian captivity is coming for them. And then chapter 10, there is some opportunity for that to be repeated. Now, you can carry out the rest of those two or three chapters on into chapter 13 to get the, the continued meaning, but I'm just trying to give you kind of a vein of where we are in the river. And, and you'll remember from our quest at chapter 4 and verse 1 where we saw the Lord speaking and he says, the problem here is that there is no faithfulness. And so we're trying to to figure out what that feels like or looks like. Because whatever that feels like or looks like, obviously we don't want anything to do with that. So why is this captivity coming? Why is it that God is looking at their behavior and saying, okay, you are unfaithful and that dissatisfies me? Okay, so let's read uh, some of these passages here. Let's start in chapter 7, and uh, let's just read through our text. We're not going to read every word, but the passages that are listed there on the left are the passages that I want to really draw your attention to, and we'll make some comments to those passages that are on the right. In chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, all of them are as hot as an oven. They devour their rulers 
all their kings fall, and none of them, none of them calls on me. Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf, not turned over. Foreigners sap his strength, but he doesn't even realize it. His hair is sprinkled with gray, and he doesn't even notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against him. But despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless. Watch. Now calling to Egypt. Now turning to Assyria. When they go, I will throw my net over them and I will pull them down like birds in the sky. When I hear them, who? Israel and Assyria and Egypt. When I hear them flocking together, I'll catch them. Woe to them. Woe to who? To Israel. Why? Because they're calling on Assyria and Egypt in a pinch. When they are in a stressful time nationally, when they are threatened, instead of calling on God, they're calling on Egypt and Assyria to help them. And God says, because of that behavior, woe to them. Why, God? They have strayed from me. Destruction to them. Because they have rebelled against me. Do you hear how God feels about that? I long to redeem them. But they speak about me falsely. They don't cry out to me. Mm -mm. They don't cry out from their hearts, but they wail on their beds. They slash themselves, appealing to their gods, that is, foreign gods. And sometimes their alliances with Egypt and with Assyria would cause them, Israel, to get involved in the worship of the gods of Egypt and the gods of Assyria. God says in verse 15, I trained them and strengthened their arms, but they plotted evil against me. They do not turn to the Most High. They're like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. For this they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Now, if you look at chapter 5, I'm sorry, at chapter 8, and you see, we've already referred to this, Israel cries out to me, verse 2, but Israel has rejected what's good. An enemy will pursue him. Look at how they're acting politically. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and their gold, they make idols. But they're crying out still to God. They're trying to say, we need you, but really they only want him to rescue or help them at that particular moment. Their real intention is the problem. And God continues to bring it up. Look in chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Now she is among the nations. Like something no one wants. Well, that's kind of a bad deal. You go out there and you get swallowed up with Egypt and Assyria. And now nobody wants you. When destruction comes on you, when my hand is removed from you, those people that were your helpers, they don't want to help you. For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey 
wandering alone. Ephraim has sold herself to lovers. Look at verse 10. Although they have sold themselves among the nations. Do you see that? I will now gather them together and they will begin to waste away under the oppression of the mighty king. They're looking for help from something other than God. This is what I'm trying to tell you. That language may be unfamiliar to you. And that's, that's why I tried to take us to Samuel first to get the record that's familiar to you. Because Saul, you get. We understand that. Oh, well, he wasn't, you know, using, he was thinking about his resources, wasn't he? Wasn't Saul really looking for like a superhero that would come along and be as big as Goliath or bigger than Goliath? I'll tell you what we need. We need us a, we, we need us a 10 footer. We got any of those in Israel? We need somebody willing to die. We got any of those? We'll, we'll buy them. Instead of looking to God. Now that is the same exact motion that you're dealing with here in the prophet Hosea. Let's look at chapter 10. You can look at the passages on the right. They all kind of present the same thought there. Chapter 10, beginning in verse 4. Uh, this is what the prophet says. They make many promises and take false oaths and make agreements. Therefore, lawsuits spring up like a poisonous weed in a plowed field. The people who live in Samaria fear for the calf idol. In Samaria, they, they, they are worshiping a calf idol. It's not in Samaria, but that's representing the north. And they are worried about their calf idol. And God says, it will be mourned over, and so will its idolatrous priests, those who have rejoiced in its splendor because it is taken from them to exile. God is going to send what they worship to exile. It will be carried, look at where it goes, to Assyria as tribute to the great king. The very people they were depending on for foreign aid, for power, to get them out of a jam. Now, they're very idol was going to be carried and sent as tax to an oppressive king in a faraway place. But finish the verse there in verse 6. Ephraim will be disgraced. Israel will be ashamed of its foreign alliances. I have a note driven... Uh, uh, scripted over to my verse 13 because it happens to be on my same page. The end of verse 13 sort of explains this and it puts the problem in these particular words. You have depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. Oh, you've had enough money. Oh, yeah, you've called on Egypt. You've sent them olive oil by the crate. You've sent them all these packages and these special pleasures so that you hope that they will come up and rescue you. You've sent caravans of goods to Assyria to try and buy them and persuade them to come over and rescue you because you were afraid of their power and you were afraid of the power that was coming against you. But you didn't call on God. You called on someone else. And you reasoned somehow, some way, by our own strength, we're going to get ourselves out of this. Chapter 12. Chapter 
chapter 12, Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day long and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and he sends olive oil to Egypt. Now, I know uh, Egypt and Assyria, huh? I mean, what does that even mean to us? How can we look at that and, and, and try to make any sense of that? It really is comparable. It's not exact. But the instance in 1 Samuel 17 where Saul is trying to persuade people financially to step into this role of love your country or where he is trying to entice someone to be victorious over Goliath by offering his daughter in marriage or the freedom from taxes, even the discouragement that he gives to David. Don't go. Don't go. You're not capable of handling that man. All of that planning and Saul's wisdom, and none of that comes to its proper fruition. None of it. It's all based on this misdirected response to your circumstance. And man, that is an easy thing to do. See, what looks like faithfulness to God from this passage uh, is this. Here's the application of what we've just run through. And I would encourage you to go and highlight or get some kind of color around those passages just to sort of bear your mind to that grouping together. And there's more passages, that's not the exhaustive. This is the thing that I want us to take away from this in a very positive sense. It's hard for us sometimes to, to be honest. Um, it's, not, it's not wrong for you to be fearful. It's not wrong. Uh, when somebody has fear and God is employed in that and he is the governor of that and there is room for God to work in that, then what you see is sort of the outcome of, of David. I, I'm sure that maybe he had not been against an opponent that looked like Goliath before. I'm certain there were things, if he was just saying, these are, these are things I've never dealt with, so I don't know what this is going to look like. But what he sounds like to Saul is, at the end of the day, God is the one who is going to be victorious. In this minute, God. And so he takes whatever apprehension, whatever of his youth would latch on to the words, honestly, of an experienced counsel of good, godly men. But David looks the opposite of that. So it's not that we have to somehow put ourselves in a position where we are like fearless. And, and maybe we pressure ourselves in that direction. 
the much greater temptation for us is that we would deceive ourselves as if we're not afraid when we are afraid. And that is the line that Saul was at. He was afraid. The record indicates the man was afraid. And so as he is governing, as he is deciding things, he does so from the fear standpoint. And it's the opposite of the faith standpoint. So this is what we can take away as a, as a game. Let's make this observation with a couple of feeders on it. You will sound wise when your fear, when your weakness when what threatens you spiritually, emotionally, physically, psychologically, you will sound wise when you take those things at Expectantly calling on God. That makes all the difference. That's what Hosea's whole point is. That's why God is so frustrated. He's like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I know, I know y'all are sending all this stuff to Assyria and Egypt. Uh, did you forget that I was here? Because if you just called out to me, I'd be there in just a split second. I would remedy your problem. I would help you out. I would come to save you. I'm a giver of great things, even to the level of abundance, to a fault. But sometimes, just like here, the enemy comes up and the king and the people, they all look like, in Hosea, they all looked like Saul and all of Israel for those 40 days that Goliath stood and knocked at the door and said, nobody's come over here, nobody's man enough to come over here and knock me down. And Hosea says, that's what's happening here. So when you take your fear or your weakness, or when you are confronting something that is threatening to you, what if it's threatening to your family? Wisdom looks like Faith, faith is expectantly, is that a word? I think it is, okay. Expectantly, with anticipation. So let's work on that word just a minute. Calls on God. Now, already look up at your page there and you see two or three places in the book of Hosea where the people were calling on God. Oh, they were calling on him. They were. They recognized, it even came out of their mouth a couple of different times, God most high. But their heart was not in it. And they weren't turning from their wicked ways. So God says, wait a minute, wait Wait a minute, we gotta, we gotta back up. I want you to call on me, but you can't call on me according to the way that you think about it. Calling on me involves changing your life. If there is something that is amiss, if there is something that needs changing, 
Faith looks like, it acts like you will sound wise biblically when your fear or your weakness or your thing that is threatening you expectantly calls on God, knowing that no matter what God is calling for me to change, I will change that. See, that's part of the believing process. James says when you pray, you should believe that you're going to have or that God will grant you those things that you are seeking from him. This is a, it's a, it's a moment where wisdom is being fleshed out. And James would certainly agree with that sentiment. Calling on God indicates that you are willing to change your life. Uh, additionally, calling on God uh, suggests this it's not that you move God to the priority place it's that you move him to the only place and those are worlds apart that was the problem for Israel they wanted to move God just to the priority place when they needed him. Hey, let's get on our knees. Let's pray for a couple of days. He'll look down. We'll make, we'll make him our priority for a couple of days. And that will be good. And God says, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not an option. I'm the only. David did not choose. He didn't show up, for example. Let's think about it. David did not show up in 1 Samuel 17 and, uh, and say, well, you know what? We got this, got this whole army here. Uh, well, I guess just for fun, we'll just shake it up. We'll involve God this time. Next time, y'all army can do it by yourselves. It wasn't an A or a B. God was the only option. You don't hear David run out on the battlefield and say, y'all better get my back. <laughs> this day, the God of heaven is going to hand you over to me, and I'm going to cut your head off. What army does David need? His own sword is going to do that by the power of God, because God is involved. David doesn't see God as an option that's wise today. He's the only. There isn't another. That's what Hosea is trying to get us to see. God is not, nor is he satisfied with you making him a priority. That's painful, isn't it? See, now that gets us, sorry, that gets us right back into that category that we're just talking about as we're calling on God. We're, we're even saying, and I'm, it's running through my mind right now while I'm having this conversation with you. What needs to change in my life that demonstrates that God is the only and not my option? What needs to change in my life? See, that's huge. And that gets where we live. Wisdom when you fear something or you have some kind of weakness in your humanity or when something is threatening you. Wisdom looks like somebody who expectantly calls on God to involve him. The last thing that I want to say is this. Uh, when you read this and you think, well, uh, what does that relate to us?
the issues of humanity are exactly the same today as they were in Hosea's day. And they are exactly the same. The day when God showed up to Abraham's house and said, I'm going to give you a son by your wife, Sarah. And you know what Abraham did? He laughed. And when Sarah heard that same report, she laughed. It's a struggle. Faith is a battle. It's a battle. This issue is a generational repeated thing. And long after every last one of us is dead and gone, and there is another generation that develops up, they will read from Hosea and take away, or they should, the same exact thing. And exactly what is troubling us, exactly what challenges us out of this passage, exactly what, prob what problem it was for these people, it will be for that future generation. So if we bump across something that is here and it's here and it's here and it's here, and that really should be something that we like put our heels down like this and say, wait a minute, I need to really understand what's going on here. Because everywhere I see it, do, 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 do. and there are in the scriptures. These stellar individuals who stand up and out, and they're so impressive, and their faith is so educational. All the Israel had been full of men and women that you read about in Hebrews 11. they would have been saved. They were not. Those men and women were the few exceptions to the rule. Hmm. I tell you, no matter what your struggle is, no matter what your burden is, no matter what your weakness is, no matter what your fear is, There is nothing that God does not desire to hear about from you. 1 Peter 5, I believe it's verse 7, says, Cast all your anxiety on Him. Of course you have anxiety. Who doesn't? Show me a human being without that. Everybody has anxiety from what threatens them, from where they're weak, from what they're afraid of. Everybody has anxiety. Cast those things, just like we talked about this morning, upon your loving God who cares for you. Mm, that's going to build you up. Jose is delicious, I'm telling you. You, you meditate in there and you'll leave a winner built up. Our goal is to learn from what unfaithfulness looks like so that we can row in the other way <laughs> with the help of God. We can and we will. If you need our prayers tonight, with your faithfulness to God, it is common to man. And if you need that, then you need to change tonight. And I'm talking to myself too. Whatever needs to change. Call on God expectantly. 
and he'll help you. He'll come to your aid and give you the wisdom and strength that you need to do his will. If we can help you with that endeavor tonight, please let us know how as together we stand and sing this song.